All right, so we're continuing our uh, talk about, discussion about roots. Uh, we started last week talking about uh, how roots can get into our lives and, uh, and what uh, we need to do with them, how, we, uh, how, we, uh, how they affect us. And tonight, if I can get my computer to do right here, uh, tonight I want us to go into the second part of that, and I told you last week, we're going to get into an area called strongholds. We're going to deal with that and some other aspects of that. But let's look in our uh, scripture there where Jesus says, Consider this, there was a farmer who went out to sow seeds. He's talking about in the parable of the sower. Jesus said, consider this, there was a farmer who went out to sow seeds. And we said that roots, you remember last week, roots are developed from seeds. That all the roots in our life come from seeds. Everything God does in our life, it is through a seed. You remember Jesus is the seed of God. In the, and he planted that the Holy Spirit placed in Mary. Jesus is the seed of our salvation. He was the seed of God's freedom for us. Uh, and so the farmer, Jesus said, the farmer goes out to sow seeds. As he cast his seeds, some fell along the beaten path, and the birds came and ate them. Others fell onto gravel that had no topsoil. They quickly shot up, but when the days grew hot, when troubles and trials and things came that stressed and could try that seed, that plant. They were scorched and withered because they had insufficient roots. And Jesus uh, tells us that insufficient roots will cause a problem. They'll cause, they can lead us to where the, into a place where we begin to wither. And if there's an area in our life that we see it's not blossoming and, and it's not all that we know that God wants it to be. Now, <clears throat> uh, let me try to just briefly uh, clarify that. Uh, and I understand this. You guys sit under some of the best teachers there are anywhere. So you're, you're very well taught. I understand that. But just allow me to go ahead and, and share uh, this, that uh, when he talks about uh, the uh, plant withering, uh, well, let me back up here. He says that because of insufficient roots, the plant withered and died. When we look at our life and we see the different areas of our life. How do we know if our life is what it's supposed to be? Do we know that by how we feel? Do we, or do we know it because other people tell us it's what it's supposed to be? Well, we know that's not the way it, we need to live our life, isn't it? Because if we're dependent on other people's, they call that codependency. And that sets us up for all kinds of problems because for everyone that thinks you're great, there's going to be others that think you're not so great. So we can't find out if our life is what it's supposed to be by watching others or listening to others or by how we feel. How do I know if my life is uh, measuring up? How do I know if my life is what it should be when I look at the different areas of my life? The only way I can know that's true is through the Word of God. So when I read the Word of God and uh, I journey through the Word of God with the Holy Spirit, taking me along, teaching me and showing me things and unfolding things to me and, and saying, wait a minute, slow down, Steve. Let's, let's just uncover that a little bit. Let's, let's look at this a little further, what you just read. And as we do that as we walk through the Word of God with the Holy Spirit, we begin to find out what life is really supposed to be like. I can measure my life against the Word. I can find out, okay, 
And I read something there and I say, well, Lord, I really see that working in this area of my life, but I don't see it over here. Is, is, is it supposed to be over there? And so from the Word, I find out where I need to work, where I need to allow God to work in areas of my life. And I kind of believe that uh, our, God gives us time on this earth for us to work on all those areas, allow him to work on all those areas, I should say, so that we're a, we're, we become fully formed, if you will. Jesus says when there's insufficient roots, some, it's gonna, that life is going to wither, that plant will wither. And maybe it's not all of our life, maybe it's an area in our life where, there, where it is withering. And plants that wither, the issue is, if they're not taken care of, they can die. So <clears throat> we said, as uh, last week's, we talked about that roots come from seeds, and that seeds are experiences, they're circumstances, they're uh, words, they're all kinds of things that have come into our life and been sown into our life as we've journeyed. And tonight we're going to see they start at the beginning and they go all the way to the end. Bad root, or, uh, our lives have roots, uh, and the issue is, are they good roots or bad roots? We all have roots, and what we need to see is, you know, is our root system good? And if there's some bad roots in there, we need to get those out, uh, like you would in a garden. Uh, you know, uh, I love to work in the garden, and when I, the weeds that are there, I want to get them out so that the good things can grow. And the same is true in our life. Bad roots that are ignored will eventually become a stronghold in our life. What is a stronghold? It's something that has a strong hold. All right? I know that's deep. <laughs> uh, it's exactly what it is, says. Uh, it's a strong hold on us. It has a strong hold in our life. And, you know, as children of God, we can have areas where there's a stronghold. We're going to look at that. What is a stronghold? It is a thought process. I would encourage you to, if you would, write notes or, uh, or at least make good mental notes. What is a stronghold? It is a thought process. Now hear me. The battle's going to be won or lost in the mind, in your mind, in your thought life. All right? That's where the battle's going to be won or lost. Uh, what, and we talked about, you remember last week's spirit, soul, and body. And the soul, the mind, it's the gatekeeper, okay? Strongholds are a thought process that has gained control. It's not just a thought that came through us, but it's a thought that now has control. And it's not a single thought, it is a process. Uh, we're going to dig into this. A thought process that has gained control of our thinking, even our emotions, and our actions. All right? Uh, <clears throat> if you've ever, perhaps you have, or if you've been around someone that has suffered a real tragedy, I mean a sudden severe tragedy, the loss of a loved one suddenly, not that they expected or something tragic really happened, uh, you will find that there's an emotional uh, ingredient involved in that, in there. And that in that area, when they visit that, or when the circumstances line up similar, all of a sudden old emotions will come up that seem fresh and new. And that experience they went through two years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, can be as fresh and new as though it was happening just now. I've sat and counseled as a pastor with people that were uh, older 
uh, people. I'm 75, and back in the days when I was pastoring, I'd be sitting and talking with somebody in their 70s or something, and they would begin to tell me about some, uh, what they were dealing with, uh, a feeling or an emotion or some kind of uh, uh, depression they were going through or whatever. And as we dealt with it, we would find sometimes there was an experience, something that happened years before, and a thought process was created that every time anything looked like, and it can even be uh, when the weather gets to be that way, or when certain things are said, or when they smell certain things, or when they see certain things, that all of a sudden these emotions start coming up that they're one, they don't even understand why. I mean, this was a great day, and all of a sudden I'm feeling this way. What is it? What is it? And they'd say, something's wrong with me. I'm not a good, I must not, am I really saved? Or, you know, uh, is there, you know, am I who I need to be? Or, you know, and I would tell them, uh, no, there was something planted in you that we've got to deal with. So a thought uh, stronghold is a thought process that has gained control, and we need to be honest with ourselves. If we're ever going to get help, if we're ever going to be truly free, and if I was to title this message tonight, it would be living free, all right? Uh, If we're ever going to live truly free, we've got to be honest with ourselves about our thinking, our emotions, and our actions. What is in control of them? Uh, Remember this, and I mentioned it last week, I believe, and I want to underscore it tonight. God means for you and I to govern ourselves. We are to govern ourselves. We're to be self-governing. All right? Uh, And I don't mean that we're to be, you know, not believe in a a government of the nation or anything like that. I'm talking about of our own self. You never want to have a relationship or in any kind of situation where you have lost complete control of yourself and you are totally dependent on someone else. You don't want that uh, because that's a setup for a problem. Our thought processes are pathways that have been created in our brains. If you could picture this, uh, maybe it'd be good if you just closed your eyes and pictured a meadow with beautiful flowers in it or a field full of clover. Uh, in the South, we, I was raised in the South, we had clover. Uh, in one of, I told you I was on a farm, I raised on a farm, and one of our fields had, would just be covered in certain, in the uh, uh, spring of the year with just uh, a blaze of beautiful cranberry, of this beautiful clover, this crimson field. It was beautiful. And I had a, uh, two Great Dane dogs and, uh, uh, the Fuji was my buddy. He was, uh, as a matter of fact, when I was real little, I'd ride on him. Uh, he was big. He weighed over 200 pounds, and he was just a massive uh, dog. And he would never let my dad spank me in his presence. Uh, my dad had to put Fuji in another room to be able to to spank me. In the South, we'd spank. They spanked back then. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, he and I would get when the field was just like that. What I loved to do is. Fuji and I run through that field, and when we'd get across the field, I could look back, and there was a path we had cut through that field. You could see it as clear as, uh, you know, it was just like a highway, a little pathway through that field of clover. Can you picture that? Okay, that is a thought process. That's exactly what our brains are like. They have thought processes, pathways that are created. Now, these pathways are called neural pathways. You can look that up and read about it if you want to. Uh, uh, There are neural pathways, and neural pathways are the connections that form between uh, the neurons in our brain. You You have 100 billion or so of them in your head, in your brain. If you didn't do too many drugs in the past, uh, uh, you, uh, and I know you never did, so uh, I was the only one that had to get saved out of that. Uh, they are, the neurons are the communication system of your brain. 
your neurons, what they do is communicate, and I'm really simplifying sometimes that God's made more complicated in this, but this is the simplistic uh, definition of it. They are the communication system so that everything your command central says, your body or whatever part of you, uh, your emotions even, every part of you responds and acts accordingly. Are you with me? Okay, so they are, uh, the, what? Uh, now, you can think of, I'm reading something here because I want to get it right. You can think of neuron, neuron, neural pathways as a pattern. Now, tuck that word away, pattern. Pathways and patterns. All right? Let's say process, patterns, and pathways, okay? Tuck that away. These neural, uh, these neural pathways, they are the pathways that the, the information system goes through, that the neurons use, and they create a pattern that represents any thought about anything you have ever had, as simple as an apple, as complicated as love and integrity. Every thought, every thought creates or has a neural pathway. Now, we're often taught that our, you know, we say our brain's like a computer and you go up there and you can open a file and do all that. We've all heard that. It's kind of like a box computer. It is not. Uh, your brain is not like a box computer where you just go in and get files. Actually, <clears throat> uh, your thoughts are more patterns if you will think of like a lady using a pattern to cut a dress or a seamstress using a pattern or uh, a pattern for something that an artist is using, uh, they are, your brains are more patterned than they are boxes. And you and I have, at our age, we've already created some strong patterns up there. And those patterns are the highways that everything runs on. Uh, so, the, these experiences, these pathways, these patterns are built throughout our life from your first breath to your last breath. Uh, I have 11 grandchildren and three great-grandchildren, and they are wonderful. They are so wonderful. I tell my kids, I know why I kept you now. Uh, <clears throat> I love them. I was, our, one of my granddaughters was over, our, our youngest daughter, uh, she and her husband live in La Quinta, and uh, she was over at our uh, home this afternoon with uh, our, one of our granddaughters and our, one of our grandsons, and my granddaughter, she's three, and she already has patterns that she, certain things that you say or do, she will react in a certain way. And she does things, certain things, to get the reaction that she has learned. If she does this, she's going to get that reaction. What is that? There's a pattern, a neural pathway that's already been created in her brain. Now, and it's wonderful. Those are good. But can you see how that can also be twisted? How it can be perverted? Even at a very early age? All right. They're built throughout our life. Now, God intends... God created and designed this system, guys. He's the master of it. And His intention was for them to be create pleasant, peaceful paths. For you and I, our, for all of us, our life to be able to walk along. He never intended for us to have all these emotionally traumatizing experiences. Now, God intends for the patterns in our mind to be good and wholesome. But the problem is we were sinful before Jesus came into our life. We live in a fallen world. We live in an ungodly environment. 
the world is not saved. We are foreigners, really, in this world. Now, it's not in the Bible, but it's all, you could say it, you know, we're not of this world. We're in it, but we're not of it, from it. We're not controlled by it or birthed from it. We live in an environment that is filled with pain, horror, injustice, infidelity, uh, abandonment, a violation. You can go down the list of one thing after another. And it is uh, on purpose. Because there is someone endeavoring behind the scenes. I'm not saying he's controlling everything that's happening, but he is endeavoring to orchestrate. He's like uh, the director. He's not playing the act, but he's trying to direct all the actors so that these everything that is the input into our lives and the lives of, of others, or especially our children, that it is creating these wrong patterns, these wrong pathways, these wrong thought processes in our life. Now, wrong paths undealt with, if we don't deal with them, they're going to eventually become strongholds. In other words, they will become entrenched patterns. My wife and I like to hike, and we were <coughs> hiking in a place called, uh, up in Dinosaur Monument uh, National Park in Colorado, up in Echo, a place called Echo Park and Steamboat Rock. We love it. They've been there different times. and uh, it's You can only go there certain times of the year because it's so difficult to get to. And we were hiking up in there, and we were following a trail, and you, you, just, you just start going, you know. There may be a trailhead, but you can go to where there are no, you're kind of making your own trail if you're not careful. Well, we were going along, and the trail got very narrow. It was a cliff right here and a cliff down to a river. And I told my wife to stay behind. I said, I'm going to follow the path. Well, the problem is the path ran out. And before I knew it, I was clinging to the side there and had to climb my way back out. And sometimes in life, we follow paths that lead us into a place where suddenly it's like we're falling off, like our life is falling. And what we've got to do is go back, find the path. <clears throat> now, our thinking gives birth to our believing. Here, write this down. Your thinking gives birth to your believing. Your believing gives birth to your actions. What's the importance of that? We've been talking about thought processes. That's your thinking. Your thinking. And what does that give birth to? Your believing. See, I can be a Christian and believe in Jesus... But I can have some erroneous beliefs about certain things because of a thought process. Now, I believe in Jesus, but maybe I have a wrong thought press, uh, idea about wrong thinking about myself or about how I view other people or how I view certain people. We would call that what? Discrimination, wouldn't we? Okay, see, <clears throat> all those things come from the thought processes that we allow or that are developed in it and we allow to be developed. Our thinking gives birth to our believing. Our believing gives birth to our action. So really, where we need to get the correction, we don't need to struggle with our believing. We need to clear up our thinking. And the worst thing we can try to do is always wrestle with our actions. I'm never going to do that again. I promise you, God, I'll never do that again. How many of you know you're probably going to do that again? Why? Because it's not the action that is the source. It's your thinking that is the parent of that. Are you with me? So how do I deal with wrong actions? How do I deal with wrong beliefs? I go back and deal with my thinking. Now, let's understand 
When I say believing, I'm not talking about your faith. That's a whole other subject. Your faith, faith is in your heart. It's a gift from God, from the Holy Spirit into your heart when you were born again. The faith of God, not your faith, the faith of God came into your spirit. Are you with me? So in your spirit is the faith of God now. But in your soul is your believing. How you believe about things. How you view things. Your beliefs about things. Have you ever talked to a Christian that really loved the Lord? They had faith in Jesus, but they had some really messed up beliefs about some things? And, some, and the sad thing is some people will say, oh, they're not really saved. Well, of course they are. If they have faith in Jesus, but the trouble is, because of their thinking, they've got some wrong believing. That doesn't mean their faith is not solid. It just means their thinking is not solid. Are we making sense? Okay. So, <clears throat> wrong thinking will create wrong believing, which will create wrong actions. Now, strongholds are paths that have been used for years in our life. Strongholds are paths that have been used for years in our life. Uh, and I, I, uh, I'm not violating anything uh, in saying this, but uh, I mentioned last week about the temper issue I had. Some of you might remember. Hopefully you don't. But I, uh, I had always had, I'd had a bad temper from a little kid and got in trouble in school a lot because of it and stuff and uh, caused issues. I was, my wife and I were married four years before I met Jesus. And uh, so there was issues there. Well, I get, I get saved and I was really born again. And yet I would still find myself dealing with that. It would, sudden that anger would be there. And I'm thinking, and I would say, and the devil would say, well, you're not really saved. You know, I'd go through all that. And what I had to do was I had to deal with some thinking there. I had to deal with that. And I told you about what the Lord shared with me about, he said, you know, I don't have a, I'm, I said, you know, this is the way I am. And he said, it's not the way I am. And that was the opening door. All of a sudden, a new thought. Are you with me? A new thought was implanted. And that opened the door for me to create a new path. Now, I said that to say this. My dad had a very big uh, uh, anger problem. He could get just suddenly become very angry. And before him, his father. Now, <clears throat> is it genetic? No, but it is generational. And there are, this opens, uh, what I'm going to share about right now is generational strongholds. What are generational strongholds? Uh, they are an embedded, twisted, perverted pattern of thinking that has become a part of the character of a family. Are you with me? That, that somewhere along the line in generations past, uh, there was through experience, however the enemy wanted to use it, a reaction, a way of thinking was beginning, was to be developed, a pattern was developed, and then believing and actions followed to where, and then that thing can get into where it's in the family. And when it is generational, now how do you know? And um, perhaps you can look at your own family and see things that were there. Uh, we could throw out some like uh, poverty can be generational. Racism is, can, is usually generational uh, where it's passed down. Uh, 
it is, I'm sorry, my computer's acting up, uh, it can be uh, uh, and, uh, infidelity. Um, all kinds of things that we immediately think, oh, that's a spirit. Well, a spirit can get involved, but really the problem comes because of a thought process that was given, uh, allowed to operate, and then that was nurtured, that was followed again and again. The path was created, and people, one generation after another, keeps following that path. I've seen families where every gener- every long every uh, child got div- went through divorces, and you know they didn't want to, but every child down through the generations, divorce, divorce, divorce. What is it? There is a pattern there. There is a stronghold, a generational stronghold that has come in through thinking that now must be dealt with. Now listen, when there is a generational stronghold, there is a spirit behind it. Doesn't mean there's a spirit in the person. There could be if it's, you know, they're non-Christian and, you know, of course. But there is a spirit always working in that situation. Now, don't be scared, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And so what do we do if that is present? What do we do if that is present? Well, what we deal with it, we deal with it in prayer. And Jesus said sometimes it even requires fasting. You remember he said, these kind come out only by prayer and fasting. See, some of them require fasting. All right? Uh, <clears throat> and so, and then the use of the name of Jesus, which is another subject we really need to be strong in. The power of his name and using that name because it's amazing the, uh, how, when we begin to use that name, how it strikes terror in the forces of darkness that are unseen but around us. All right, so when there is a generational stronghold, and if there happens to be someone you know, or maybe you, that is dealing with that, then I will tell you you deal with it sternly. Do not be passive about it because that's what the enemy loves, is passivity. You never see Jesus part asking the enemy to, I'm sorry to have to do this, but would you mind? No, he was always very stern and bold, wasn't he? All right, we need to be stern, bold, and with authority. And the faith that God has put in our spirit, not our belief system, but our faith. We need to use the name of Jesus and speak very boldly to those things. And I've done it so many times. I I did it in my own life about something that, uh, you know, just kept plaguing. And I realized, okay, there's something more than I'm dealing with here, and I've got to deal with it at the root. Jesus said, now, the, or John said, now the axe is laid to the root, speaking of Jesus. Are we making sense? So you deal with that. Strongholds, now listen, they reside in our mind, not in our body. Sin is in your body, strongholds are in your mind. Okay? So we deal with strongholds uh, accordingly. Uh, what do we do when there is a stronghold? Whether it's a generational or whether it's a stronghold in our life that we just realize that is there. We must deal with it. Uh, I'm sorry. We must deal with it uh, in, by creating new pathways that begin to open up a whole new way of thinking that will create a whole new way of believing, that will begin to create a whole new way of acting. The, I, I loved, as a pastor, watching people that came in to the services, and uh, I'm not exaggerating, like on any given Sunday, uh, any given Sunday, we would have a, a small response was 30 people giving their heart to Jesus. We would have 50 100, 200 people answer the altar call to get to give their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every Sunday, people getting saved. And the beautiful thing was, I mean, it was a large church, but the beautiful thing, you know, I, I love that. So 
uh, I was always, you know, when I'd come into the Sunday, next Sunday, I'm looking for those because I remember, you know, because I would go down and personally pray for all of them. Now, when it was really huge, you know, I didn't pray a long time, but I'd just go around and greet everyone. But, and so I would look at them and watch, and uh, I love to watch them in the process. And it was amazing to see the transformation, like putting a flower on the, uh, by this kitchen sink in the, at the window there, and watching it go, or a little plant that you put the seed there, and it begins to come up, and the little shoot comes up, and then before you know it, this is rising up, and then, the, uh, and then all of a sudden, the little blossom comes out. And that's what it was like watching their lives. And what was beautiful, I realized what I was watching was new pathways being created in this life that now they would be going in a completely different direction. <clears throat> so we, to create new pathways, requires learning as a child of God. We need to learn. We need to think. We need to let our minds be renewed by the Word of God so that we can think the thoughts of God. Let's look at something here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, uh, Paul says, The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have power, divine power, the power of God to demolish strongholds. <laughs> we demolish... Not, that's right there. If we stop right there, we would think, well... Okay, how do we do it? Do we worship real loud? Or do we pray real loud? Or do we pray longer? Or what do we do? We shout at the, are the, those things? How do we demolish those strongholds? You remember when uh, they were going, the children of Israel came to Jericho and they were going to uh, uh, go into the, they're facing Jericho. And you remember it was a greatly walled city so great that chariots could ride along on the top of it and uh, and here was this ragtag uh, army of people uh, that had been uh, in slavery uh, years before well actually it was the children of, the, of those that had been in slavery how did they demolish that stronghold by hearing from God and by obedience to what they heard. So God planted a thought in them, if you will. And then they acted on that thought. And the stronghold came down. See, when you read the Word of God, God's giving you his thought on the matter, his thought about you, his thought about life. I know I'm telling the truth because he said, for my thoughts, see, God has thoughts. The word of God is God's thoughts. And so when we read the Word of God, when we hear the Word of God, when we listen to the Word of God, we're receiving God's thoughts. And then if we act on God's thoughts, we get the results that God's thoughts produce. We demolish, now here, see, so he tells us, we have the power to demolish strongholds, we demolish Arguments and every pretension. There it is. See, what is a stronghold? It is a thought process. It is something, an argument in there. It is, a, it is in your thinking process that the enemy has set up that or in the, uh, in the mind of a person that sets itself up against the knowledge of God.
And we take captive every thought. That's why I said earlier, we need to think. We need to be honest with ourselves. I'm not talking about getting all bothered and saying, oh, is, there something, wrong? is something wrong with me? No, but when you know there is, think soberly and deal with it. And bring that thought captive. Bring it to the feet of Christ. You know, in a sense, that's what I was doing when I was talking with God about the, me dealing with anger. I was honest with him, and I told him my thought, and then he gave me his thought. And his thought was the new pathway, the deliverance. We bring every thought and we capture every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Now, there is a fight, Paul tells us. The fight is not finished until we demolish every stronghold. Do not allow anything in your life that you know should not be there. Do not allow it. Deal with it before God. Don't sit around and condemn yourself. Don't sit around and let the devil condemn you. Don't let other people condemn you. Deal with it. <laughs> One of our altar workers, back when I pastored, had really bad breath. And nobody would, you know, I, I, uh, he and I were talking, and I didn't want to say anything because some other people were standing there, and he had just been praying for people, and I told the, uh, the staff member that was over that, one of, that was one of his areas, I said, you got to talk to him, he's got really bad breath. Well, he was, he didn't want to hurt his feelings. And so... Uh, I didn't know he didn't talk to him. And so uh, after the ser uh, next service, people answered the call, and this couple came down, and he's praying with them. And, and so after they did, I went over, hey, so glad you guys are here. And they, we got to talking, and they said, somebody needs to give that guy a breath mint. <laughs> I thought, you're kidding me. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, what I had to do was, uh, you know, in a kind and gentle way, I said, I talked to him about it. I don't remember how I broached the subject, but uh, it worked. He, uh, he accepted, and he said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even know, you know. He was a single guy, and uh, if he'd had a wife, he probably wouldn't have had that issue. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, see, you, you can't allow things to just go unchecked, undealt with. Don't be afraid. Don't let the enemy tell you or let your mind tell you, oh, this is just the way you are, like I did. Because it's not. It's the way you were. Old things have passed away. All things are becoming new. The old is gone, the new is come. And that is a process. We're becoming new, all right? So <clears throat> the battle, as we said, is in the mind with thoughts, concepts, reasonings. You've got to take them captive with the Word of God. That's the beauty of the Bible, of the Word of God. All right? If, here's what I do. A lot. When I read the Word, my grandson, he and I were talking last night. He, he's uh, in Vanderbilt University. He got a full-page scholarship there, academic scholarship. He's doing phenomenal, on fire for God. And, and uh, he and I were talking, and he asked me, he said, Papa, he said, what is your devotion, your time with the Lord? What is that like? And, and I told him, I said, well, here's what I do. And I said, uh, I went through some of the different things that I do. But I said, I usually always begin it with this. I said, I get my coffee, my Bible. And I said, and I'm usually the only one up right then. And uh, I said, I will say, Holy Spirit, teach me today. As I read the word, teach me today the things I need to learn. Show me where I need to change and change me. Now listen, the day you quit changing is the day you've died. The day you quit changing is the day you've died. 
And the wonderful thing about the people I'm looking at, mostly with gray hair, is you have the ability to help others who are younger because you've been through a lot of the changing process. And you can help them along that process. But as you're doing it, you need to be ever-changing because uh, we, you know, it's not just uh, something we teach, it's who we are. And then you impart that to those you're helping and leading. So take every thought captive. We're talking about dealing with strongholds. Here's what Paul said. He said, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, Romans 12, 1 and 2, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. We're going to close in just a minute here. This is your true and pr proper worship. The Bible, you remember, Jesus said the Father seeks those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. We tend to think worship is, I love you, Lord, singing songs and worshiping like that. Here, Paul says what's true and, and perfect, our proper worship, is when we present our bodies to him as a living sacrifice. Why? Because Sin dwells in my body. That's my protection. I present it to Jesus. Here, it's to you. And he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you will be able to test and prove God's perfect will. God's will. His good and pleasing and perfect will. <clears throat> now, Paul gives us some keys here. He says we need to offer our bodies, refuse to be conformed to this world, refuse to allow those patterns to stay within our thinking, refuse to live by them anymore. What if I had said, when God said to me about temper or anger, it's not the way I am. What if I had said internally, well, that's great, you're God, but... I'm not. And this is just the way I am. I could have allowed my own thinking, my own strongholds, my own issues to conform me that have been conformed and twisted by the patterns of this world. I could allow them to conform my life, my Christian life, to that pattern and to never be free, to always walk with that limp. And never fully be all that God wants me to be. He said, offer your body. Do not conform to this world or the pattern. Patterns? Do not conform to the patterns of the world. But be renewed by the, in your mind. See, the word of God goes in and it has the power to create a whole new thought process. To begin to create new paths, new ways of thinking that bring about new ways of believing that create new ways of living. Father, uh, I tried. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to let these seeds that I've sown, I ask you to use them for your glory. In every life, you know how each one needs whatever their need is, where they can use it, where they can appropriate these truths. I thank you, Lord, that you strengthen them and help them. I bless this people in your name, Jesus. Amen.